You don't want to be that guy that's dying at the VA hospital with oatmeal dripping off your chin because nobody's going to visit you. I like that. We're going to call that the oatmeal test. <laughs> the oatmeal test, exactly. Right? You got you to yeah. test yourself every, you know, do a head check every month, every year, whatever. Just do an oatmeal test and say, am I going to be the guy in the hospital with oatmeal dripping off his chin, nobody visiting? You know, that, that look around, I mean, the world is in trouble. We were probably in more trouble than we've ever been. And, uh, and if you're not raising good humans to, uh, to be able to, to, to adapt to that, then uh, you're not doing your job. Welcome back to Spartan Up the Podcast. This week, we have a special Veterans Day episode for you all with retired Command Sergeant Major Rick Lamb. This gentleman is truly a remarkable human being. He served in two Ranger battalions, four different special forces groups. He's really served this country. Yeah, he has. Speaking of Veterans Day, if you're watching this on Veterans Day, please go to at Real Joe DeSena at Instagram. He has a special gift for all the veterans to thank you for your service. Um, speaking of service, 40 years, 37 countries, five continents. Rick is an unbelievable human being. Um, but what I found most incredible about this interview is that he really shows us how to take all the leadership lessons and his experiences that he uh, gained serving yeah. and how to bring it back to your civilian life and how he used the same lessons to make his family healthier, stronger, better. A really, really great interview. Absolutely. I'm Seth Alexandra and this is Dr. Johnny Waite. Joe and Colonel and I are off on their own adventure today, but make sure you subscribe on YouTube, follow us and stick around because afterwards we will talk about this remarkable interview. Enjoy. All right, Spartan Up, we are at Fenway. We are with retired SOCOM Sergeant Major Rick Lamb. I get that right? Perfect. Bam. I'll answer to that. All right, so um, you're awesome. You've had an unbelievable career, decorated career. Um, went straight up to the moon from uh, 18-year-old. You, you uh, entered the military? True. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a story, right? I can tell stories? Let's do it. Let's yeah, hear it. So we're story, storytellers. We have been since the dawn of time, and we know this because of cave drawings. There you go. So I'm an 18 year old kid. I report into First Ranger Battalion, and I meet my fire team leader. Where, where was that? That was in uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia, and then we jumped into Hunter Army Airfield a, a couple months later. So it's down there in Savannah. Were you nervous? And uh, oh yeah, 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 because the uh, w w the recruiter had told me in the beginning. He said, "Hey, sell your car. You know, don't take anything down there because you're gonna be in the swamps all the time, and, and the uh, the rubber will literally rot off your tires." So I, I just went down there, you know, with whatever clothes I had on my back, you know, after basic training in AIT. That sounds like a motivational talk to get you excited about going, hey, listen, don't bring a car down there because it's just going to rot where you're going. Oh, exactly. You know, and one of the reasons, that I was in Iowa, so it's cold. It's in the winter. Right. And I drive into the recruiter, and uh, he, he had, um, you know, they used to come to track meets and that kind of stuff and try to enlist you. And uh, I had said, no, no, yeah, I'm going to, um, I, I wasn't thinking about the Army at that time. And it was so cold that day. That uh, when I drove into recruiters to get a cup of coffee, and that's all I wanted was a cup of coffee, right? You weren't, you weren't, you weren't even on the fence. Oh, exactly. And, and you guy, just literally wanted a cup of coffee. And, and the guy goes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> duh. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the guy goes, hey, Rick, is there nothing I can't say to get you into the Army? And I said, you show me that Ranger video one more time and send me someplace warm, and I'm in today. And uh, so when I roll into uh, Hunter, Army, Hunter Army Airfield there at, uh, in Savannah, and I meet Corporal Dozier. He, there's only about two years difference between us, but but the difference between us was was huge in experience because he had already had two one year rotations in the first Ranger Battalion, and those guys will do mountains, they'll do desert, they do uh, they do jungle, you know, they'll do uh, Arctic, uh, they they do all those rotations in one year plus the weapons qualifications. They send their all, all their non commissioned officers, all their leaders to Ranger School, which is the U.S. Army's premier leadership course. So you know, and this, this kid had already done two one year Solid rotations years, yeah. in there. So the, the conversation goes that's like this. That's your first meeting. That's my first meeting, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so he comes up, and he looks the part. So, yeah, that's, that's something to, to remember as well. Look the part. You know, look the part, be the part. So, uh, so he comes up. You know, he's just, uh, he looks like an he's, airborne he's, ranger. He's tight. Oh, God, yeah. yeah did. So he comes up, and he says, I'm Corporal Dozier. I'm your fire team leader. My motto is follow me and do as I do. So that's like the, how the first 15 seconds go. So he already reinforces the chain of command. He tells me that he's, uh, he's in charge of me. He tells me that, uh, you know, watch me because I'm going to show you what right looks in like. Two, in two sentences. In, in two sentences. Exactly. And the look. And, and the, exactly. Right. So, so I'm, I'm like, uh, uh, uh. And in a lot of ways, I've, I've spent my entire career acting. 
because the first guy that I acted like was Corporal Dozier. Right. You know, because the next thing he does, is he, he gives me a little manual, and it's just a little, little tiny three by five manual, and it's uh, it's on my rifle, the M sixteen A one. And he goes, this is the manual for your M16A1. He says, it's a gas-operated, air-cooled, magazine-fed, shoulder-fired weapon that can be fired on either semi or automatic by use of a selector switch. It's chambered in 5.56, and it's good out to uh, 300 meters, maximum effective range. And to a kid coming right off the street, you're like, what, what language is he speaking? <laughs> yeah. but, but he had just recited the first paragraph in that manual. Right. And he goes, know this rifle, because you are a rifleman. So he tells me who I am. And, uh, and he says, the men on your left and right are counting on you being a master of your profession, the profession of arms. So know every spring, every pin in this rifle. So then he goes, this is a ranger handbook. That's the next thing he pulls out. And he goes, we are rangers. This is who we are. So he's already told me who he is. He's already told me who I am. And, he, and now he tells us who we are collectively. And he says, the history of the United States Rangers along a colorful saga it goes back over 200 years. It goes back to prior to us being a country, you know, like uh, in the 1750s with uh, Francis Mary and the Swamp Fox, you know, in the, in the, uh, the, the Indian Wars. So he says, learn the lineage of those that, that came before you because you, these are the guys whose shoulders we stand on. And he, s- he goes to the next page and he goes, this is the Ranger Creed. He says, there's six stanzas in the Ranger Creed. You're given stanza number two tomorrow from memory during PT. And he said, that's my favorite stanza. It's acknowledging the fact that a Ranger is a more elite soldier who arrives at the cutting edge of battle by land, sea, or air. I accept the fact that as a Ranger, my country expects me to move further, faster, and fight harder. He says, so memorize this tomorrow because you're going to be up in front of the, uh, the squad given this. And he said, but memorize all six by the, uh, by the end of the week. And, uh, and and those rangers live by a creed. So that's another takeaway is that, uh, you know, you, the, the leaders have to care. They have to invest in you. But you also have to live by a creed. You have to know what's expected of you. And you're and three then, minutes into this meeting so We're three far. minutes into it. Yeah, the second little book. Yeah. And, uh, so then he has me a third book. And he says, this is FM Field Manual 7-8. It's the infantry platoon and squad. And he says, this is what we do. So I know who I am. I know who we are collectively. And I know what I'm supposed to do. And uh, he says, you'll know this book cover to cover. And because uh, he said, you know, the people of the United States expect us to be elite warriors capable of doing things with our hands and weapons better than anyone else in the world. Do not violate that trust. And that's how the first meeting went. And uh, the whole time this kid is, is coaching and mentoring me, he says, all right, when you when you um, become an expert rifleman and uh, you know that job, he says, I'm going to put a grenade launcher on the bottom of that rifle and I'm going to make you a grenadier. He said, that's a whole different job. He said, because a rifleman does point targets. He says, the grenadier, he does area targets. He can shoot stuff through windows. He can shoot stuff over a hill. He can get into the low area where the enemy's hiding. And he said, so he augments the rifleman. He said, once you become a, an expert grenadier, he says, I'm going to put a bipod on that rifle, and then I'm going to give you three additional magazines, and you're going to be an automatic rifleman. Automatic rifleman puts more firepower on target. So he says, it's kind of like an orchestra. you got the rifleman, you got the automatic rifleman, and you got the grenadier, and that's how we take down a target. He says, once you've mastered all those positions, I'm going to make you a senior rifleman. He said, then you're going to teach everybody else. And he said, then and only then will you be able to do my job and be a fire team leader. He said, because I want you to be a fire team leader because I'm going to take Sergeant Chandler's position as the squad leader. So he's already exciting you about um, the ability to move up. You haven't even started yet. Oh, exactly. Yeah, he's he's told me what exactly is going to make me successful, what my left and right limits are. And uh, he's investing his time and his energy in making me his replacement. And how many of these meetings is he like, are there tons of kids coming in? Oh, yeah, it's, it's uh, well, I, I got assigned to his fire team. So right. uh, at that time, it was 11-man squads. There was two five-man fire teams. So I'm one of four kids that uh, that he has to take under his wing. Got it. That just and, showed uh, up. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, during that time, it was replacements. So I'm, I'm like an individual replacement. But there were, were there were many kids that just showed up because we had graduated a Ranger uh, indoctrination program. Yeah. And so they'll, they'll send you needs of the Army or needs of the unit. And I just happened to get uh, first squad, third platoon, you know, a Bravo fire team and uh, – Corporal Dozier was my man. Corporal Dozier sounds like he had it together. I'm listening to you and I'm thinking uh, we could use that exact um, system in, in, in our company. Like as because we get new people all the time, right? We're putting on races all over the world. And if everybody if everybody acted like Corporal Dozier, like that would be incredible. Hand a little book. That's, that's right. right. Read it, study it, study know it. Because yeah. tomorrow hold, you're going to be you reciting accountable. it. <laughs> yeah. No pressure there. <laughs> no, but I, I like that. Yeah, and, and, if, and if you screwed it up, and, and, and the thing about that creed, too, because you know, that, that's what everybody embodied. And I just went to the Ranger Rendezvous in, uh, I think it was July, 
and uh, so I'm standing there, we're in a big hangar, and uh, and I see the four-star, you know, General Clark, who's the SOCOM commander, and he's standing up there next to a private, and, uh, you know, the Sergeant Major gets up, and he gets on the intercom, and he says, all right, Rangers, the Ranger Creed, re- repeat after me, and he goes into it, and uh, everybody locks up, and I mean, so the four-star general standing next to the private, standing next to some dude from uh, the Korean War, you know, standing next to me, Everybody in that whole place is just a crescendo of the Ranger Creed, and they go through all six stanzas from memory, and uh, so everybody lives it. So yeah, that's what when uh, Clark started out as a lieutenant, he learned it, and uh, he carries it with him all the way to yeah, four star awesome. general. So everybody, everybody knows exactly what they're doing, what their position is, um, and and why they do it. Exactly why they do it. Right. So so um, so I guess one big takeaway from this is uh, we talked about it a little bit before before the talk is um, to be a good leader, and I think you gave a great example with, with Doja, right? Um, you gotta look the part. True. Because he looked the part, even though you guys were almost the same age. Correct, yeah, yeah. I mean, right? he just, he had that, uh, he had that swagger. And uh, so that was the thing too, is that the, the kids expected a swagger. Yeah. And uh, so I developed a swagger over time as well. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, uh, because you can tell when the sergeant major goes into sergeant major mode, I mean, everybody stops what they're doing, even the officers, and they turn their head and they'll listen and because he's, he's fixing to crank up. Yeah. And, uh, but, but again, the fitness piece of that is, is, is important as well. You want to be they, fit. You want to look the part. Exactly. You got to right. lead from the front. And, lead from the front. Uh, you gotta follow. Stand, and, and, and it sounded like he had, he had language mastered. True. You know, follow me and do as I do. That, right. that was his mantra. Right. And uh, so you know, you're looking to the guy to the left and right, and that's that's the big thing. I mean, if everybody sits in the in the foxhole, doesn't get out of it, right. nobody will get out of it because you know there's people shooting at you. Right. But it takes one dude to stand up and said, "Let's let's get after it, boys. Let's go to work." Right. And uh, but, you know, Somalia, perfect example. And uh, when we were in Somalia, you know, we had just gone out and, and uh, we got our handed to us because the city was just on fire right so we had some casualties you know the backs of the vehicles were full of blood and uh so the, the some of the kids came up and we'd already gotten into the compound so we're safe and then uh you know colonel nixon comes over to us and says hey we got to go back out man a chopper just went down we got to go get these guys so you finally got and to a safe spot exactly you just want to get people wanna healthy say, Woo, man you yeah. take a breather <laughs> and colonel nixon comes over and says retool rangers were going back out right. and and you could see i mean nobody balked they just looked you could see the look on their face you could just see the blood drain out of their face and, and their their eyes said everything like we just made it into the perimeter and we got to go back out and again that's where you just had to sit down and say all right guys we knew this was going to be tough when we signed on it right. took one guy to step up and say let you know, let's get some more ammo get some more frags get uh, put some sandbags in these trucks you know to, right. to, to stop the rounds and we're going back out because we got guys out there and everybody's like Ugh! Right. <laughs> and they just get after it. Yeah. So, and that and that come and that comes from uh, great leadership, like you said, but also tremendous camaraderie. True, I would imagine, right? Because you're not going to leave, you're not going to leave folks out there. No, and you're you, not going to let somebody walk out that door without going with them. True, and it's part of the Ranger Creed. You know, you never right. leave a fallen comrade to fall in the hands of the enemy, and under no circumstances will you ever embarrass your country. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, these kids live it. So let's talk about team. That was another thing we talked about before the podcast, right? How do you build? How do you build a high-performing team? I, I think it's the, it's that shared camaraderie, it's that shared sacrifice. The uh, there was a guy by the name of Sebastian Junker, and he uh, he wrote a book called Tribe, and uh, he went to Outpost Restrepo, who was in Afghanistan. It was just this horrible place that uh, was kind of down in the Korangal Valley. The enemy owned the high ground, but you needed to sit in that uh, on that piece of terrain in order to control all the road networks coming in and out. So, uh, so he went and he embedded with, uh, with this infantry platoon. And he, he noticed that uh, even the this guys... Right, this writer. This writer, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and they had to scurry around like rats. I mean, they lived like puppies on top of each other. I mean, you had to scurry from one point to, to the other. Because, because, it, because the enemy had the high ground. Because the enemy had the high ground, yeah. Right. I mean, the, anything from snipers to mortar fire to you name it. And uh, so somebody was always taken around. And he, he noticed that even the kids that, uh, that they didn't like in the platoon, they would still risk their lives to run out there to grab him and pull him in because he was part of the family. Right. And uh, you know, they always say that uh, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. That's kind of how the military is. I mean, the uh, it's all shades of green. I mean, they are your family, yeah. and uh, you, you take them for better for worse. But uh, the, the you know the fact that uh, you know that, that caring means making times tough in a lot of in a lot of instances so because tough times is going to ensure survival and a hardship borne by one will be borne by all 
And I mean, trust in that is, is, is sacred. So when they see that to the left and the right, and, you know, there's different styles of leadership. You know, there's the directive one where you, everybody's just yelling at you. And, uh, but then there's the participative one. And the participative one starts when you're a fire team leader, follow me and, and do as I do. And then you're, you, know, you, you, get, uh, you, you get dependent on the guys to your left and your right. So it is this family aspect of building the team. You start to build bonds that are unbreakable. And trust. Yep. And trust. Just trust. Yeah, right. You got to trust each other, right? Because otherwise, why would you walk out that door and go back into fire? Correct. Yeah, because you know right. I, I've got a job to do. Yeah. So the spar. I was just in Sparta, Greece. I just got back, and I was with the mayor, and um, and he was talking about this idea that you know, in, in most of those ancient uh, cultures and ancient cities, they had walls uh, protecting the city. But Sparta, they said, we don't need walls. We are the walls. True. Yep. Right. Oh, that's awesome. Isn't, isn't it? that awesome? Yeah. And, and it, was, it was that trust, it was, um, but that started at seven years old, that, hey, we're gonna work together, right? We're gonna train together, we're gonna do hard things together. So it, they become yeah. brothers. And, and they were smart enough back then to say, hey, when we eat, we eat together as True. a family, yep. right? And, and that's kind of how the, uh, the military is. I mean, the, the leaders eat last. Right. So you wait till the last private has gone through the child line before the, uh, the leaders get into line. And uh, so it's just that, that shared sacrifice, that shared sense of purpose. You know, that camaraderie, the, yeah. uh, everybody knows his job and everybody is, is dependent on that man knowing his job to the point of where uh, he doesn't let the other guys down. And that's, that's really in a nutshell, you don't want to let the guys down. Yeah, because it's easy to be, it's easy to be soft and take a shortcut alone. True. Right, when no one's looking. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give you another story. It's uh, just recent. Uh, I'm, I'm at Fort Benning I'm, uh, you know, for my job, right? And uh, so whenever you're at Fort Benning, you always go to the, the Ranger Memorial and you look at the stones and then you, you, know, you, you laugh and smile and you know, recognize guys that are, that are you know, engraved in the rocks. And uh, so my phone rings and it's my buddy Scotty Neal. And uh, so Scotty says, hey, Rick, uh, he runs American Freedom Distillery out in, uh, in uh, St. Pete. And uh, it's a little veteran-owned business. It's a bunch of you know old uh, horse soldiers. They were the, the the guys, the initial guys that went into Afghanistan. It's them. And, okay. Uh, yeah. So so they're 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 brewing hooch now. And uh, so he calls me. He says we're jumping into Normandy for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Are you in? And I said, Hells yeah, I'm in. And then I hang up the phone. and I'm thinking. I'm 60 years old. What did I just commit to? <laughs> exactly. What did I just commit to? I've jumped in 15 years. And so we get up to for the training. There's about 10 of us, and we got a little gut. We got a little spread going on, and uh, the guy looked at us, and he said, some of you boys uh, haven't missed a meal lately. <laughs> he goes, you got to shed some pounds. So uh, he said, it's all about what you put in your mouth. Yeah. And he said, and I know you haven't been rolling around on the ground. He said, this, these are round canopies, and they're not going to set you down as soft as you think, as soft as you remember. And then he says, you're going to have to do a parachute landing fall, which is uh, just you know, your ability to roll on the ground and kind of uh, – take that force and dissipate it yeah and uh so you're know, kind of like judo almost so the he says you got to get get down on the ground roll around and uh and i'll be that that start was, training start eating healthy yeah. exactly and yeah. so that that was what i needed that 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 uh that focus to do that mission that was what i needed to, to get because you don't want to let shape. everybody you don't want exactly. to be embarrassed yeah. right well, because you already, you, already, you already said i'm going to do it right. so now you either have to go out in the ambulance and deliver or, right. uh, or <laughs> yeah and so then we I mean, jumped but, into Normandy. It was uh, it was awesome. I mean, it was a bunch of passionate people that were passionate about history, you know, passionate about the the guys that went before them. I mean, we had young kids from uh, from Holland and from Belgium that, uh, that that were dressed up like U.S. soldiers that knew our order of battle, that, oh, wow. uh, that knew how we wore our, our uniforms. I mean, they just they knew the history. Every place that we would uh, come up to was an old guy that uh, would would come out in a in a walker. And so I remember when the Americans land, and and he would tell you how America came in and did great things. Things, you know, either saved his family, saved his house, you know, saved his nation. And uh, it, was, it was just a, a, a good, upbeat, you know, event. Experience, I mean, anybody, yeah. Yeah, anybody that's not gone to, uh, to Normandy for one of those. Got to um, do it. Got to do it. Put it on the bucket list, yeah. yeah. Like you guys should do a race over there. We should do a race yeah. there. That would be unbelievable, right? Come out of the water. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Come out of the water, climb yeah. the cliffs. Yeah. That would be awesome. Let's take a break. And uh, you fired me up. Why don't we knock out 300 burpees? <laughs> and, then, and then we'll do the second half of this. <laughs> if you're listening on Veterans Day, we want all the veterans to actually go to Real Joe DeSena on Instagram. There's a special offer for you there to thank you for your service. I'm having a, I found out this morning, by the way, that um, the brain washes itself when you sleep. And so my brain needs a cleaning because <laughs> I don't sleep. <laughs> so, so that's the issue. 
Oh, that's another big thing, man. Uh, you you got to get good sleep. Got to get good sleep. Yeah, you crush the burpees. That's when the body. The uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was impressive for for 60, 61. I mean, you beat 61. me. <laughs> no, but yeah, I got to get some sleep. Burpees. Um, can't do burpees all day, every day. Exactly. You yes. need some sleep. <laughs> so, but let's let's dive a little bit into that camaraderie uh, discussion we had because how do you how do you build that if you're not in the, if bullets aren't flying. Right, and we don't have to head back out uh, into those kind of tough times. How do you build the, the, those tight bonds? I, I think it starts with the carrying, the uh, the carrying piece. I mean, just knowing that, uh, and I'm not talking about touchy feely carrying. It's just the, the the fact that they know that you have their back. So from the leadership perspective, I mean, you've, you've got to show that, that that you care about them, uh, that that you're willing to invest the time in them. That uh, and then you just you just build that team. You can do it by doing um, you know, events like like your challenge. You know, bring your bring your guys, your corporate uh, staff to the Spartan Challenge, and we're just going to get after it. Because right. again, if you remember, to carry means making times tough. Because tough times will ensure survival. So the uh, and then a hardship borne by one will be borne by all. Once they kind of get that, and the fact that you're investing in them and that you want to see them progress, I mean, that, I think that's one of the problems in business now, is if you see it, if you have an up and comer, then uh, then you almost feel threatened. You're like, hey, he's after my job. Well, in the military, you know, of course he's after your job. You want him to take your job. You want him to move up. But you also want him to fleet out. I mean, if there's a, if there's somebody over there that, that needs him worse than you do, or that uh, that there's an opportunity for him that'll take you further than maybe you can take him, then uh, then he needs to know that uh, that you got his back and you want him to go pursue that. So I yeah. think that's the big thing. It's just you, know, you, you got to care, you got to invest, and they have to they have to trust. I love I love the um, I love the language part too. Uh, it seems like Rangers, or military in general, has just nailed it. It's very succinct, right? It's it's True. Uh, easy to remember. And um, and then you just start to believe in it. True. Yep. Yep. And it, and it becomes yeah. It becomes a part of your persona, who you are. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 I mean, if you pick up a Ranger handbook, the uh, it's going to tell you uh, the history of the Rangers. I mean, so you know, okay, I'm I'm part of this family. I'm part of this lineage. I can't screw this up. And then uh, you know, you turn the page, and the next page is that that Ranger Creed, and it, it tells you very succinctly, you know, who you are and what you need to do in order to be successful in I order to be a, a Ranger. I got to create a, a family handbook. I gotta see if my wife yeah. would buy into that. We gotta, you know, just something simple. Right? Well, see, and that, that's part of it too. The whole family thing is uh, I mean, that's that's what you leave. That's the legacy you leave. You know, all the uh, all the. And I look at my uh, at my family. You know, the uh, and, and it's, different things are important to you at different times in your life. And when you're young and up and coming, I mean, it's all about you know the uh, my job, my job, my job, my career, my career, my career. And uh, I mean, I served in uh, two of the three Ranger battalions and four of the five Special Forces groups. You know, I was in th- over 37 countries. I was on every continent except for uh, Antarctica and Australia. And uh, so people ask me, they say, why didn't you serve in all three Ranger battalions and all four, all five Special Forces groups? And I tell them, well, because my wife quit. I mean, she, <laughs> when, I, when I got out of Iraq, right, I, I called her on the phone and she hung up on me. But, you know, I, I didn't catch it at the time. Right. I thought it was just a bad line. So I called her again and I said, hey, baby, I'm out of the clique. And so I emailed her. I said, "What's up?" And she said, "I'm tired of being an army wife." I mean, so she told me very succinctly that uh, you know you can you can go serve in three of the Ranger battalions and all five of the Special Forces groups, but you're doing it without me. So I had kids. You know, I had a lot of time invested in that young lady, and I loved her to death. So uh, so I said, "All right, I'm getting out." So I went to my boss and said, "Hey, here's my retirement paperwork." That was and it. Yeah, yeah, that was it. So the, so, so uh, the real the real um, leader in this story was why it just took a click. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 12 and, seconds, you were gone. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and everything's done for a purpose, right? So right. so we retire, we go, uh, now we're out among the English, right? We're off the security of the, of the military base and uh, you know, all, all that that provides. And this is our first time really out, you know, in the general population. And uh, so, you know, I look so at my... So wait, how, how old were the kids when, when she, when the click happened? When the click happened, yeah. uh, 10 and 12. 10 and 12, yeah. all right. So it, it, and it, it just so happens that that's about the age where they really, really need you, sure. I mean, especially in this day and age, you know, with uh, with all the social media and everything. Sure. I mean, they, they need they need so many. And, and I, I felt pretty comfortable in their, uh, you know, in their, in their character yeah. because they had uh, they had been around military guys their entire life. I mean, so the, the, the role models were all there. Yeah. And uh, but now we're out among the English, you know, we're, we're kind of we're, we're disconnected. And uh, so I started noticing in my son that he was staying inside a lot. And uh, way too much, and uh, what year, and that, what that year was just, this, um, this would have been oh three, oh four, I guess. Okay. 
So video and, games uh, are becoming pretty video big. Video games are becoming big. And we had resisted the urge to get him a video game until we got out. And so now we're out and he's just hooked on this thing. And I said, buddy, that's not you. I mean, you're an outside kid. You're always climbing in trees. You're doing something. And uh, so I said, we're going to put the video games, you know, we're going to take a little pause on that. And uh, we're going to put it up. And then he, you know, he, he, he drooped. And I said, go get a piece of paper and a pencil. So he runs and go get a piece of piece of paper and a pencil. I said, Cause how, I, how long had you been home at this point? Um, probably a year, a good year. All right. Just you know, just watching him and seeing what he's up to because yeah. you know, I had been gone for the, like the previous two years. Sure. And uh, so I'm, I'm just getting reconnected, and, and that was one of the reasons she hung up the phone was that you know, I, <laughs> it's obviously you don't care. So I had abandoned her in actually uh, in Germany. Right. And had been reassigned to Africa, and then from Africa to Jordan, and then from Jordan to Iraq. Be- and and that, uh, by the way, for for those listening and watching out there, it happens. So it all happens to me, right? You just get so invested and so myopic in your job and your true. mission yep. and your guys or girl, right? And yeah. and and because uh, we were going to war, and they had to be ready, right? And uh, you know, it, it, but my wife is very resilient, so I just figured she's got this, right? And uh, but when you're stranded in a foreign country. And, he, and uh, you know, your husband is like two commands removed. So yeah, I'm not even her sponsor anymore. Right. And she's uh, she's in a foreign country. Sure. So I uh, should have thought that one out. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so 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 you're sitting in front of your son. You just ripped him off the uh, video game. Exactly. And I said, I've been watching you, and, and we're going to map your passions. Every man needs passion. And uh, so I said, I see you uh, flying airplanes with your joystick. I said, do you want to no kid and get a private pilot's license? I said, the hijackers were trained just right down the street. And uh, so he goes, yeah. So we'll write it down. Single engine, land and sea. So he writes it down. I said, I see you doing the martial arts stuff. I said, we got Gracie Studios. A guy by the name of Rob Kahn is right here in Tampa. Do you, do you want to get a black belt in martial arts? He goes, yeah. I said, write it down. So I see you doing the Omaha Beach landings, you know, the, the shooting games. I said, do you want to get a Brownells manual? Now, Brownells, I don't know if you're for the guys that aren't shooters. You know, Brownells is a company out of Iowa, and they make this big um, – book it's it, it's got every piece every spring every uh, and then you can buy the parts and make your own so i said we will build a pistol a carbine and a rifle and i'll teach you how to shoot them you know i used to do this for a living and he goes yeah so write it down i said how about uh, tack up and ride a horse drive off road uh dr- you know get a motorcycle license and, and so he's, he's like yeah 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 so i said all right here's the deal put four years of college on that thing and speak a foreign language and then sign it so he signs it, and I said, "Now I'm going to countersign it." So this is Dad's, and this will uh, take a commitment. week. This whole this whole mission. <laughs> <laughs> so I countersigned it, and I said, "I'm going to bankroll all this," and I said, "Now turn it over." And he turns it over, and I said, "Right, I will not be a turd." And so he writes, "I will not be a turd," and I said, "Now here's the list." And I said, "So no ear, no ear piercings, no body piercings, no tattoos." And he goes, "Dad, you have." body piercings and tattoos i said i know trust me on this one i said what i don't want is for you to get a a big old tattoo yosemite sam with two six guns and his junk hanging out and then go for a job interview i said because what you like at 14 or 15 is not maybe what's going to sell to your boss when you're uh, when you're 21 so trust me on this one and uh there will come a time that i just want you to know what you're what you're doing to your body i said uh no turd no no piercings no tattoos Yeah, no run-ins with the law, no no smoking, no right. drugs, no right. drinking, no getting your girlfriend pregnant. And he goes, Dad, I don't have a girlfriend. I said, D- D- you will? <laughs> so uh, I said, the, right. these are, this is the list. Right. And uh, I said, be, uh, th- th- so in order, in order to get what's on the other side, you, know, you have to commit to this lifestyle. And uh, so he, he signs it. And then we put it up by his you know, desk, and then he checked it off. As we, uh, we, we spent 12 years checking it off. So you fast forward 12 years, he's a senior at USF. And uh, I mean, he's a beast. And, uh, he can shoot. I mean, he's a master diver. He's a pilot. He can do all those things. And uh, so the deputy sheriff who was running the range uh, comes over and he says, "Hey, son, when do you get out of the military?" Because he had seen him uh, seen him you know, shooting. shooting. And he goes, "Well, I'm not in the military. I'm a uh, college kid at USF." And he goes, "How does <laughs> how does that happen?" And he goes, "That's my dad over there." And so he pulls a card out, and uh, and he gets ready to hand him a card, and, and he pulls it back, and he goes. You got any piercings? You got any tattoos? You got any run-ins with the law? And he goes down the list, and my son starts laughing, and uh, so he goes, "What's what's so funny?" I said, "That's that's my dad's list," and uh, so he goes, "We'll sponsor you in the academy at Hillsboro, you know, uh, Hillsboro County, Florida. It's a big, big uh, sheriff's department." And he said, "Once you're out of the academy, then you can dive for us, you can fly for us, you can work here at the range, you can do, but you got to do two years on the street." And nice. uh, so he got sponsored through the academy, went into law enforcement. He's a good kid. He's got a, you know, he's got a will to help people, a strong heart. 
and uh, you know, always joke that uh, you know he's uh, he's into guns, he's into drugs, he's into gangs, and roams the street at night. But, but you know, you're doing, you're <laughs> in doing, and out of jail in, all the in time, a healthy but. way. But but um, and it all happened with one click. With one click, one exactly. click. It was yep. it was your wife's click of the phone because if she didn't do that, it's easy to just watch family kind of maybe slip away. Oh, exactly. You know, cause especially if you're into what you're doing. And because uh, she, you know, when I got back to Germany and she said, uh, you can take care of all this household good stuff, I'm going home. Right. And uh, home to her is Korea. And, right. uh, you know, so we, I, I think we've been married 20 some odd years at that point. And uh, so now we're going on 34. And, nice. uh, yeah. Strong, you owe her. Stronger than ever I and, do. And owe your her. son owes yeah. her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> True. Oh, yeah. Because she's, she's, I mean, she's just, she's better than me, smarter. More organized. They all are. I wish I wish I had her uh, her yeah. ability to just organize and and uh, that and, and commit. Yeah. So I mean, recap, and it's three big things, right? It's um, it's it's quality leadership. True. Yeah. Right. And 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 you nailed a few big big points there, which were um, look the part. Yep. Right. Look the part. Be the part. Be care, the part. Care. Invest. Invest. Develop. Yeah. Um, camaraderie. Camaraderie. Build a exactly. team. Exactly. Yeah. Trust the man to your left and right. The, Which is that uh, tribe with your life exactly with, with that tribe, and you see those tribal aspects that uh, that go out into the, the workplace now. The suicide rates are kind of up, and uh, and the reason I think a lot of that is it, the Restrepo um, and you know the, the book Tribe hit on that is that the guys they, they don't have that purpose, and uh, they get out and they flail a little bit without the purpose, and that's why you see a lot of the veteran-owned organizations that are out there like American Freedom Distillery yeah. or the uh, the Grunt Style, the T-shirt guys, yeah. I mean Black Rifle Coffee. If you watch their videos, it takes you right back to. Uh, yeah, the camaraderie that, feeling that you felt that camaraderie. in the team room, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and they're kicking ass. All of them are doing really well. And so they're and they're missing it when they when when, when veterans get out. They're, True, they're missing yep. that. You don't know where you fit. And so let, let's talk about that because we got Veterans Day here. Um, we at Spartan, we, so we're six million people um, have gone through this uh, program, and what we found was um, military coming out. Veteran, they love this because they feel what at is? home. They feel yep, at home yep. again. So what we're gonna do is uh, we're going to give away a bunch of entries on Veterans Day. Oh, that's so, awesome. And by the way, we'll always help veterans. doesn't matter if it's Veterans Day or not. But if anybody ever needs anything, just email me, joe at spartan.com. I'll give you an entry. Anyway, but let's have them. Uh, how are we going to do this, John? We're going to have people follow, comment on Instagram, comment on Instagram right? We're going to do an Instagram post on, on Real Joe DeSena. Take a veteran, you know. We'd love to hear, we'd love to hear what you thought of the um, podcast as well. And, and, um, and tag a veteran, you know, we're going to give away a bunch of entries. You're good, man, Joe. Yeah, we'll do that. And by the way, even if you're not a veteran, uniform service, whatever, we, we want to help. Beautiful. Um, and so, and so, and then the last one you hit was uh, family. Family, yeah. That, that's, uh, that's what you're left with at the end of the day. You know, as the body fails, the brain fails, everything else. Like we were talking about earlier, you, you don't want to be that guy that's dying at the VA hospital with oatmeal dripping off your chin because nobody's going to visit you. I like that. We're going to call that the oatmeal test. <laughs> the oatmeal test, exactly. Right? You got you to yeah. test yourself every, you know, do a head check every month, every year, whatever. Just do an oatmeal test and say, am I going to be the guy in the hospital with oatmeal dripping off his chin, nobody visiting? You know, that, that look around, I mean, the world is in trouble. We were probably in more trouble than we've ever been. And, uh, and if you're not raising good humans to, uh, to be able to, to, to adapt to that, then uh, you're not doing your job. One last thing I want to hit. I, I told you I just got out of Sparta, and it ties to everything you just said. Uh, the mayor of Sparta sat me down and said, you know, everybody thinks uh, ancient Sparta, they were bloodthirsty, uh, they were battle-hungry. He goes, in fact, the message at seven years old when these kids got plucked out of homes and, and went into training for 13 years, the message was, hey, if we want freedom, freedom from disease, freedom from tyrants, freedom from bullying, we got to be tough. we got to be True. strong. And if you're not... You're not free. You're dead. True. That's, that's right. <laughs> so yeah. so um, I, I think we could all take a page from yeah. that book. You're a surfer. You're a victim. Yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Right. This was awesome. Damn. It was awesome. Thanks. Anything Joe. I missed? Good. That was good, right? Yeah. Really Let's cancel all the other um, podcasts. You know, Sephra, as soon as he came in the room, I knew we were going to hear something important. And as soon as he starts speaking, um, you just know it's going to be profound. Not just know it was profound. Yeah. Um, Really? Yeah, really, really remarkable guy. Yeah, you know, it's the same thing. Whenever Colonel Nye walks in the room or any of these military gentlemen that we've had the honor of being in the presence of, it's just 
the way that they hold themselves is with such integrity and such elegance that you you can just there's that inference of so much wisdom and so much experience that they've had that it really makes you listen and pay attention and and they command respect just by their nature you know they say look the part be the part and it it's really it's really true it just yeah and, and the cool thing is he, he was here specifically to contribute like there's nothing yeah. in it for rick to come do this right he's he's here hey we're to, good people but he's but he's here to make a difference right <laughs> yeah and i mean obviously it's what he's always been about he's 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 about service right um I love that he talked about when he retired, how he saw there was still tremendous purpose in what he was doing. He was now all about raising better humans, a whole new generation of great people. And um, I think that that's that's tremendously valuable for for people listening is A, that there's always an opportunity to serve um, in some way. Uh, And and he talked about that with Joe, the idea that, that, yeah, um, and some of this actually we should all be in service. And well, I think one thing that's great too for us is sometimes there's these little great chats off camera quickly, and, right. then, and then the camera starts again. And one thing I Behind think actually what was off camera was he said to Joe um, that that we have to create more opportunities for people to serve in general. Maybe not everyone's going to end up in the military, but there is an opportunity to serve, to serve your country, to serve the people around you, to serve your community. Right. And you know, and that's a big part for Joe too is how can he be of service to people? Right. And um, and when when Rick was talking about um leaving the military and how hard that transition is for veterans because they've been in an environment of purpose, of mission, of um, shared sacrifice, right? And a lot of things that are missing in society right now, we're all about what's in it for me and, you know, uh, arguing with people all the time as opposed to having a, a shared purpose. Right. And um, uh, so so any opportunity that you can find purpose, uh, create a community around that and, and drive forward. Now, he did it in his family too, which was fantastic. Uh, when we were talking about about what we wanted to share from that interview, we both really gravitated towards that list he made with his son. And I, I want to hear your thoughts on it. But but first, I just want to mention that um, one thing I loved about it was he saw his son uh, starting to go down a path of some behaviors that weren't going to serve him very well. Mm-hmm. And what do most parents do? They jump in and they say, you're going to stop doing this. You're going to start doing this. Here's how you're going to behave. Here's what you're going to do. And our kids rebel. And we wonder why. Um he instead helped his son identify the passion, uh, the passion, the purpose, yeah. and the where con- the interest was, yeah, and the consequence, yeah. and and to go through and to say, hey, what's important to you? Once he established what was important to him, said, cool, can we agree that these are some actions that would help you get there? Hmm. Yeah, great. Can you commit to that? Yeah, and then said, great, I'll commit to you. I'll commit to that as well. Right. And uh, he talks about trusting the person to your right and to your left. Yeah. He was that person. He created an environment where that he was that guy. Well, which makes so much sense because he's um, here speaking to Spartan X, which is a leadership conference. And it's just amazing to see how these principles that he applies to his family that he learned through the military can be so pervasive and so helpful you know, we're talking about building community and being in service. If the leaders and the CEOs who are at this Spartan X can hear how he role models that by identifying people who work for you, what their passions are, what they're doing, and then like making a shared goal and a shared list, that's how we build build strong community. That's certainly what we're doing at Spartan. And that's and that's certainly how you can be both succeeding, right? You're accomplishing yeah. what you want to accomplish <clears throat> as the military organization or as the company or as the father of a family, but also just progressing as better humans. Yep. I mean, we all should be helping each other. And the thing you know that we love about Spartan Race is inherently it's making people healthier and giving them a supportive community to do it in. Mm-hmm. And so it's just... It's wonderful to to have great tools to be able to lay out your goals with it. Yeah, you know, and do well, that. With- and, and, he, and he talked about evolving priorities in life, and no matter where you're at in your life, you know, if you're a young person just starting out, understand that finding purpose and finding community is important. Um, if you're in the middle of building your business, look at these tools and say, how can I apply these exact same things? And then if you're at the end of your career, you're retiring, um, and that's where a lot of um, retirees, you know, people who retired from the military, veterans. Um, struggle is is i used to have this purpose and and he's right. he's all about well find that purpose find that community find that way to serve others right we need to have a cross we need to have a hybridization of these conversations special for you know ex-military need to learn business skills and business guys need to learn these resilient skills and when we have situations like this that can happen so um it's a great interview to all of you veterans out there thank you very much for your service 
So thanks very much for being here. Thanks very much to the veterans. Again, this is a special Veterans Day uh, episode with an incredible veteran. And we want you to subscribe. We want you to be here because we're going to bring you great people week after week. YouTube, Instagram, Apple Podcasts. Uh, We love you. Thanks for being here. See you next week.